Welcome to the BT Colloquium of the month of May. We are very pleased and honored that we got John Ellis to give us a talk here. I guess John doesn't need any introduction. He has here been several times. Even your wallet has been stolen once. That was, the, that, that was only the first but time. But this, this was only the first time. Now is a bit more careful for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you still have it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, well, uh, John is uh, at CERN responsible for the uh, relations to the non-member states. And he was telling me he was I'm trying to decrease them. And he was telling me that he works on decreasing them so when he retires, eventually, that all the states will be member states. Nonetheless, uh, Austria seems uh, to be working against that. But in any case, we are honored that you also visit member states because we hope that uh, Germany still will be a good member state also in the future. So, OK, John will talk about uh, the LHC, which is, of course, uh, in the focus of the attention uh, lately, uh, and uh, we are looking forward to his talk. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's uh, nice to be uh, back here again. I think I was just here a couple of years ago or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I'm uh, very happy to be back here now that you have this uh, better institute. So uh, I think it's a bit of a challenge to explain to mathematicians uh, what it is that we're trying to do with the LHC. Uh, so I apologize in advance for uh, failing to do so. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't know if it's possible to reduce the light by maybe bringing down the slide or something. No? The camera people also. Ah, OK. Well, anyway, I hope that people can uh, see this OK. So uh, for those of you who don't know the region of Geneva, Ah, what you uh, see here in the back is uh, the Mont Blanc, so the Alps. And then in the foreground, you see the tip of Lake Geneva. Uh, over here, you have the center of Geneva itself. Just in front of Geneva, you have the local airplane accelerator. Uh, and in front of the airplane accelerator, you have the particle accelerator. Uh, so the particle accelerator has a circumference of uh, approaching 27 uh, kilometers. Uh, it's designed to accelerate beams of particles so that their kinetic energy is similar to that of, an air, of a flying airplane, uh, by coincidence. Uh, of course, uh, most of it is something like 100 meters underground, so you don't see very much uh, from the air, uh, just a, a few surface buildings. Here's one example over here. So clearly, the LHC is a, is a mammoth project. Uh, it's uh, taking a long time, many technical challenges. Uh, it's involved a tremendous amount of people's effort. And I think my job this afternoon is to uh, try to explain to you uh, why all this effort has been exerted and what we hope to get out of, as I say, the world's most powerful microscope and telescope. So I thought I'd start off by uh, reminding you of this uh, famous picture by Gauguin. So uh, these people are asking themselves some very important questions. Where do we come from? Uh, what are we? Uh, where are we going? Uh, the reason why I show this is because uh, back when I was a graduate student, I had a reproduction of this painting uh, on the wall of my office just to remind me why it was that I came into work every day. Uh, and basically, that's still why I come into work every day. And uh, that is also uh, the objective of the LHC. Of course, uh, we ask the question in a somewhat different way from the way that these people are asking it. Uh, but uh, at a very basic level, what we're trying to do with the LHC is to uh, understand what the universe is made of. So what do we know so far? So uh, very briefly on uh, one slide for the uh, benefit of any uh, cohomologists who stepped in. Uh, we know that uh, matter is made up out of uh, these particles. Uh, we don't know 
why there are the number of particles that there are, why, for example, uh, there are three neutrinos, why there are six quarks. Uh, we know there are four fundamental uh, forces, uh, gravity, electromagnetism, and, of course, the uh, two nuclear forces. So I, I like to think of these as being, in some sense, the cosmic DNA. Uh, these particles and their properties, the forces between them, somehow or other contain all the information necessary to make everything visible in the universe. And they do that through the standard model. However, this standard model has quite a large number of parameters. Uh, it has three separate uh, gauge interactions for the uh, strong, weak, and electromagnetic. Uh, there's also uh, an unobserved uh, CP violating phase in the strong interactions, which we're all very puzzled about. Uh, if you ask how particles acquire their masses, uh, they acquire their masses, we believe, through some things called Yukawa interactions. Those interactions, again, introduce many parameters uh, corresponding to the three different masses of the charged leptons, uh, the six different masses of the quarks. Uh, then these guys all mix together through uh, three angles and a CP violating phase. And if that wasn't enough, uh, there is the uh, mythical Higgs sector, which, as I will discuss in more detail in a moment, is a part of the standard model that's supposed to give masses to all the other particles, but for which there is so far absolutely zero experimental evidence. Now, in the simplest possible formulation of that, uh, it has two additional parameters, and you can easily write down uh, more complicated models in which there are more parameters. So adding it all up, you've got a total of 19 parameters. And uh, certainly when I was a graduate student, I was hoping that eventually we would come up with a theory of everything with fewer parameters than that. So uh, what are the priorities in trying to uh, make some sense out of this and go uh, beyond the standard model? Well, clearly one thing that you would like to do would be to uh, unify the fundamental forces simple uh, gauge theoretical structure. Uh, you would certainly like to understand this very bizarre pattern of uh, masses of the fundamental particles, uh, and also why there's so many of them and why they mix the way they do, uh, something which we lump together uh, with the term the flavor problem. And of course, we would like to understand whether particle masses really come from the Higgs boson as was uh, laid down in the ancient texts. So, so those are the three you know, big issues. So what is the origin of particle masses? Are they due to a Higgs boson? Why are there so many different types of matter particles? As a third question, let me ask something which goes beyond the standard model. The astrophysicists and the uh, cosmologists tell us that something like 80% of the matter in the universe is some form of invisible dark matter. Uh, there's no candidate for it within the standard model. Uh, if the astrophysicists and cosmologists are correct, then there has to be some additional <coughs> stuff, maybe particles, maybe something we can make with the LHC. I already mentioned the unification of the fundamental forces. Uh, I should also say that uh, perhaps the deepest problem of all in theoretical physics is uh, how to combine quantum mechanics with general relativity and make a true quantum theory of gravity. Uh, here we are almost a century after quantum mechanics and general relativity were formulated, and we still don't have a, uh, an agreed theory on how they can be combined. Uh, of course... We all imagine that it's done through string theory, uh, but uh, just today a paper appeared talking about 10 to the 32 string theories. So uh, there's still a little way to go before we know exactly how it's done. So what I'd like to argue in the course of this talk is that the LHC has the potential to attack all of these problems. I think it has very good chances of providing answers to uh, one or two of them, and with a bit of luck, we might actually be able to make some progress with some of the others. 
So let's start off with uh, what is perhaps the most uh, urgent of uh, particle physicist problems. Uh, why do things weigh? So when I'm talking about this to a general audience, you know, people often think, well, we, we know about mass, right? It's something to do with weight, right? Newton told them that. And then they all remember E equals mc squared. But what I tell people is that uh, these two honorable gentlemen somehow forgot to tell us where the mass comes from. They relate mass to other things, but they don't tell us where the mass comes from. And uh, this is the guy who maybe has the answer. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Higgs, uh, complete with a very nasty tie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his theory on the blackboard. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of the theory. Uh, the particle theorists know it, and if you're not a particle theorist, you're not going to master it in uh, the, the five minutes that I could devote to it in a colloquium. But rest assured that uh, according to this theory, uh, well, it's got a field up there called phi, and uh, like any other field, that field has a particle associated with it, a quantum, and that is the Higgs boson, which has become, in some sense, the, uh, the holy grail of particle physicists. This is the missing link in the standard model that we are striving to find. Perhaps a little bit of an aside uh, on the relationship of Mr. Higgs to Mr. Nambu, who got a half of last year's Nobel Physics Prize. So both Mr. Nambu and Mr. Higgs uh, are famous for their work on spontaneously broken symmetry. So spontaneously broken symmetry is when you've got a symmetry, like, for example, this is a little bit like, since we're in Germany, the bottom of a beer bottle, and it has a rotational symmetry. Uh, the vacuum is the lowest energy state, so it's going to go to the bottom of the bottle. But is it going to go over here, or over there, or over there, or over there? If you like, the direction that it chooses is, is arbitrary, and it's chosen uh, spontaneously. So there are two aspects of this very simple uh, picture. One is that as you run around the bottom of the beer bottle, your energy doesn't change. And that is the massless degree of freedom identified by Nambu. The other aspect of the problem is that if you go radially, you know, from the center of the beer bottle to the outside, then the value of the energy changes. That corresponds to a particle which does have mass, which does have energy, and that is the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson, you can think of very naively as being this sort of radial degree of freedom in this simple spontaneous symmetry breaking model. Okay, so according to the standard model, this thing should exist. Where the hell is it? Well, uh, previous experiments at CERN uh, with the LEP accelerator failed to find it, and that tells us that it weighs more than about 114 GeV. Uh, indirect evidence suggests that it is somewhere around 100 GeV. So these are the latest numbers with two significant figures. You probably shouldn't believe the second significant figure. Maybe you shouldn't believe the first significant figure. But at least the indication is from other precision data that it probably should weigh somewhere around 100 GeV or so. So this gives us uh, an upper limit, which different people might say 150, 200 GeV. One very interesting recent development is that uh, experiments at Fermilab in the United States have made a direct search, and they've actually been able to exclude uh, a range of Higgs masses between 160 and 170 GeV. Uh, their result is shown on the next slide here. So forget about all the colors and stuff. Just look at the solid black line, OK? So that is their upper limit on the rate of production of the Higgs boson. And the horizontal straight black line is the standard model prediction. So here you're OK. Over there you're OK. But there's an intermediate range of masses, as I said, between 160 and 170 GeV, where they exclude the Higgs boson. 
So, in fact, there's a little bit of a, of a, of a tortoise and a hare race going on at the moment. Uh, Fermilab is operating. It's chipping away, looking for this Higgs boson. And uh, the LHC hare is just sort of uh, leaning up against a rock, just relaxing. And, of course, eventually, when it starts up, it's going to find the Higgs boson. But let's get it started. Yeah, OK. I sort of don't like these lasers very much, but <laughs> particularly when they don't work. Oh, there it is. OK. OK. So th this is actually uh, the combined information that we have putting together the precision electroweak data, LEP exclusion, uh, exclusion by the uh, Tevatron. And I'll come back to some deeper theoretical implications of that uh, maybe later on. OK, so uh, experiment is uh, closing in on the Higgs boson, but my slide is not moving. Ah, OK. So uh, I would characterize the uh, theoretical uh, mood at the moment is one of nervous excitement. Uh, here are these ideas that we've been flogging to you experimentalists for the last 45 years. And it's about to be proved whether they're right or wrong. And it could be they're wrong, right? Uh, so theorists are busy coming up with alternative ideas so that when you come along and say that Higgs is wrong, that they're going to say, ah, oh, but our theory is OK. So people are thinking about uh, composite Higgs bosons. They're saying maybe the interpretation of the electroweak data is at fault. Uh, they're saying maybe you should include extra operators in the standard model. Uh, coming up with alternative Higgs theories, and some people are even saying maybe there's no Higgs at all. I'll come back to the no Higgs at all hypothesis in just a moment. So, so for many years, we've uh, lived with uh, the uh, proposal that uh, the Higgs might not actually be an elementary particle, as Mr. Higgs originally assumed, but actually composite. Uh, part of the motivation for this, most of the motivation for this, comes from considering uh, quantum effects on the effective Higgs theory. These quantum corrections are very big. And uh, one possibility for dealing with them is to uh, cut them off with supersymmetry, a theory which I will turn to in a few minutes. The alternative is to say, ah, those divergences are fake. Uh, the Higgs is not really an elementary particle. It's really some sort of extended blob which doesn't have those divergences. And, well, the inspiration for these theories is taken from what we know in many other areas of physics. Uh, we know that in other areas of physics, like, for example, superconductivity, like, for example, QCD, that uh, fermion-antifermion pairs, or fermion-fermion pairs, often like to condense. And when they do condense, then uh, they can give you spontaneous symmetry breaking effects, much like the Higgs boson. That's basically uh, what happens in the BCS theory of superconductivity, for example. So people have had a fine old time trying to propose so-called technicolor theories of composite Higgs bosons. Uh, I personally believe that those theories, at least the ones that I've seen that are calculable, uh, disagree with the precision electroweak data. So I'm not going to waste a lot of time on them. Uh, but uh, I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of people who in five years' time may come back and say, I told you so. But for the moment, let's assume that they're not correct. So I mentioned uh, another possibility, which is that there's uh, no Higgs at all. Well, let's just think back a little bit as to uh, what is the job of the Higgs boson uh, to see whether there really is any alternative to it. So as I already mentioned, the basic job of the Higgs boson is to break the symmetry of the standard model, if you like, break the symmetry between the different types of particles. Now, when you break a symmetry, uh, you can either just choose non-symmetric equations, but that generally gets you into technical problems, and in fact, it would actually be mathematically inconsistent in the case of the standard model. Or you choose asymmetric solutions to symmetric equations. That's spontaneous symmetry breaking. And that was, of course, what was done by Higgs. 
OK, but if you're going to break the symmetry, uh, there's actually a couple of alternatives that you have. One is to break it uh, throughout space, which is basically what is done by Mr. Higgs et al. The other possibility is to break it not everywhere in space, but on a set of measure zero in space, uh, basically at the boundaries. Uh, so the idea is that you would impose boundary conditions which break the symmetry of the standard model. But hang on a moment, you may say. Three-dimensional space, I don't see any boundaries. Okay? How do you do it? You postulate extra dimensions of space. And so there's a whole industry of people who uh, postulate a mechanism for breaking the symmetry of the standard model uh, by boundary conditions in those extra dimensions. So uh, when I'm talking to those politicians and trying to convince them to stay in CERN or get into it, I tell them that we're looking for the Higgs boson. I tell them also it'd actually be much more exciting to prove there is no Higgs boson. Because, well, first of all, it would give work to the theorists. Uh, but secondly, uh, that would possibly be evidence for additional dimensions of space, which I think would be much more exciting than some boring old boson. OK, there's a universe out there. That universe is expanding. Uh, here is uh, where we are, roughly speaking. And uh, this is the beginning of the universe when uh, stuff was very dense, uh, very hot, uh, very high pressure. And you can regard, in some sense, the LHC as uh, recreating the conditions that uh, existed in that very early universe. So uh, here is a, a brief history of the universe so far. Uh, before about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, atoms didn't exist. When the universe was less than about three minutes old, uh, nuclei didn't exist. When the universe was about less than about a microsecond old, protons and neutrons didn't exist. When it was less than about a picosecond old, we actually think particles had no mass. We actually think it's that picosecond epoch when mass appeared. And by recreating very high energy collisions at the LHC, basically what we're trying to do is to get back to this epoch when the universe was a picosecond old and see whether this is right or not. Now, at the same time, we can uh, look maybe into a couple of other fundamental astrophysical and cosmological mysteries with the LHC. As I already mentioned in the introduction, Astronomers and cosmologists tell us that 80% of the matter in the universe is some sort of invisible dark matter. In many fashionable theories, uh, that was produced, or sort of, if you like, decoupled from the observable matter in the universe sometime between these two epochs, when the universe was of the order of a nanosecond old. Another issue is where the matter in the universe came from. Uh, we know that antimatter exists. Uh, an angel, when the Angels and Demons movie comes out tomorrow, you know, a few billion more people will be reminded that antimatter exists. Uh, but in the universe, there is not very much antimatter, uh, except at CERN and other particle laboratories. Not as much as in the movie, but at least some. So one of the big puzzles is, uh, why does the universe not contain more antimatter? We know there is some difference between matter and antimatter observed in the laboratory. Could that be related to the matter-antimatter difference in the universe as a whole? Well, if, it, if there is a connection, then that connection presumably was made when the universe was a picosecond old or younger. So there is a chance that maybe with the LHC, by getting to this picosecond threshold, we might get some hint as to how the matter in the universe was created. So uh, just a little bit of a reminder about the uh, strange recipe of the uh, cosmic pizza. So uh, 
here are the percentages of uh, the energy density of the universe contributed by known particles like neutrinos, ordinary matter. And as you see, the great majority is contributed by dark stuff we don't actually see. So one is the uh, dark matter. So I'll be spending a bit of time in a moment talking about that. And uh, later on, if I have time, I may have a little bit to say about, uh, about dark energy. So dark matter. Uh, here it is, right there. Uh, this is uh, a regular galaxy, much like our own. And uh, the astronomers tell us that galaxies swim basically in invisible swimming pools of dark matter, uh, which are actually, in some sense, the glue that holds those galaxies together and prevents them from uh, flying apart because of centrifugal force. So there's a number of different theories as to what that dark matter might be. A number of those theories are based on particles which weigh something like a TeV, which will be accessible to the LHC. Uh, it will come as no surprise if I talk about one of those candidates, which is <coughs> supersymmetry. So supersymmetry is uh, a theory which uh, is theoretically extremely attractive. It is the most powerful known symmetry capable of relating matter particles and force particles, particles with uh, differing amounts of spin. Uh, I like to compare different types of particles to ballet dancers, and some of them spin at one rate and some of them spin faster. And uh, supersymmetry is the only symmetry which can relate, in principle, all those ballet dancers to each other. Not only that, but it could help the Higgs do its job of fixing the particle masses. Uh, it could help unify the fundamental forces. It predicts a light Higgs boson. Uh, and it could provide dark matter. So uh, uh, supersymmetry is, uh, I would say, a wonderful theory. And my preferred front runner for physics beyond the standard model to be discovered with the LHC. Uh, a little bit about what perhaps historically was the uh, primary motivation for thinking that supersymmetry might show up at the TeV scale. And it comes back to our uh, infamous friend, the Higgs, and it comes back to the quantum corrections to the effective Higgs theory that I mentioned briefly a few slides back. So here are a couple of typical quantum diagrams, one loop. Each of those is quadratically divergent. So put in a cutoff lambda. Here it is, lambda squared. So cutoff, I don't know how big that cutoff is. That's the cutoff where the standard model breaks down. It might be um, grand unification scale, might be the Planck scale. Anyway, it looks like you're going to get a very big contribution to the Higgs mass. Note, however, that these contributions have opposite signs. There is a minus sign there, and there is not a minus sign there. So if you were clever, and if you related the couplings of the scalar particles over here to the fermion particles over there with the right factor of two, then you could cancel out those quadratic divergences, and you would have tamed the loop corrections to the Higgs mass squared. So this relationship looks a little bit arbitrary, but it turns out to be exactly what happens in supersymmetry. And not only that, but supersymmetry would guarantee that not only the one-loop diagrams cancel out, but also the two-loop diagrams, the three-loop diagrams, the 864-loop diagrams. So that looks like a pretty good way of stabilizing the mass of the Higgs boson. So there are other reasons to, uh, to like supersymmetry. Uh, one of them, which has uh, been advertised since the early 1990s, is the fact that if you have supersymmetry, as seen in the bottom panel here, and you extrapolate the uh, different gauge interaction strengths up to high energies, uh, they look like they might unify. Whereas if you did that just in the standard model, they would not. 
So supersymmetry could help you unify the fundamental forces. Supersymmetry predicts a relatively light Higgs boson. This is taken from a paper we wrote a few years ago. Many other people have done other similar calculations. Supersymmetry, almost inevitably, the Higgs weighs less than 150 GeV, and that's just what is preferred by the accumulation of uh, data that we now have. So, lots of good reasons to like supersymmetry, uh, but as I think it was Feynman once said, if you had one really good reason, you wouldn't need to quote five. Uh, just a, a word maybe about uh, the matter, antimatter asymmetry. So uh, when antimatter was originally uh, postulated by Dirac, uh, he and I think pretty much everybody else thought that matter and antimatter would behave exactly equally and oppositely. And it actually came as a big surprise when it was discovered uh, in laboratory experiments in the 1960s that actually matter and antimatter don't quite behave in the same equal and opposite way. This is something that can be accommodated within the standard model. In fact, the other half of the 2008 Nobel Physics Prize uh, went somewhat bizarrely, to Kobayashi and Moskawa for working out how to incorporate matter-antimatter asymmetry in the standard model. Is this why the universe contains more matter than antimatter? The answer is no. Uh, it's been established that although, in principle, it could give you a matter-antimatter asymmetry, in fact, the standard model does not violate the matter-antimatter asymmetry enough. You need additional violations, and that is one of the things that you could look for at the LHC. Uh, you all know this guy. Uh, what I find impressive about this guy is uh, his eyes. I mean, he must be about six years old in this picture, and he's already looking very sad. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he didn't come up with unified theory. This is his last blackboard. No unified theory there. Uh, one of the ideas that he played around with uh, was that there might be extra dimensions of space. And uh, indeed, uh, with modern string theories, the idea that there might be additional dimensions of space has uh, got a big boost. And uh, needless to say, this is also going to be one of the things that we're going to be looking for at the LHC, although uh, I personally am not holding my breath for it. So putting this all together, there's uh, a whole bunch of different things that we might be able to find with the LHC. Uh, the origin of mass, nature of dark matter, maybe supersymmetry, uh, maybe extra dimensions. Uh, but I don't want people to run away with the idea that I'm saying that the only physics experiment worth doing is the LHC. It's clearly not the case. Uh, there are some things which you can only access indirectly via the LHC, quantum gravity, ground unified theories, neutrino masses, and so on. And these things, presumably, are the uh, province of uh, astrophysics and cosmology. By the way, while I am speaking, they're supposed to be launching the Planck satellite. Uh, so I, if anybody happens to hear whether it goes up okay, uh, please let us know. Sorry? It's okay? The first five minutes were okay. Then I came to Because, no, the, the, there's 1.9 billion euros of satellites sitting on top of that. So it's. Uh, I actually tried to see whether I could connect to the Wi Fi here and, you know, monitor. No. Okay. okay. So uh, they have their Planck satellite, we have the LHC. So uh, here's the LHC tunnel, complete with a few of the 1,232 15-meter long, $1 million dipole magnets. So with this thing, uh, the plan is to collide protons, uh, each with an energy uh, of 7 TeV, up to a billion collisions per second. And I've already advertised many of the principal objectives of the LHC, 
origin of mass, nature of dark matter, matter versus antimatter. Here I also mentioned the study of the primordial plasma. Uh, by colliding, colliding heavy nuclei, you can recreate small volumes of space with the primordial quark-gluon plasma, um, but I won't discuss that physics in this talk. So previously I had shown you uh, an aerial picture. This is a, a cutaway view showing you the LHC tunnel, on average 100 meters underground. And uh, around the ring, you have four collision points uh, where particles will collide. So Atlas and CMS, those are the guys looking for Higgs and supersymmetry. Uh, LHCB, that's looking at the matter-antimatter asymmetry. And uh, Alice over here, that's the one that's going to be looking for the primordial plasma. So these detectors are uh, ready. Uh, they were pretty much ready last year, but they're certainly ready now. These are uh, somewhat old pictures, but they, the virtue is that they actually show you what these things look like inside. Uh, if you go to visit uh, one of the caverns, remember these things are typically in underground caverns 100 meters below the surface, uh, what you tend to see is the muon detectors on the outside, and you can't actually see what's going on inside. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, these things are big. Here is a person there, okay? If you've got your microscopes out, you might be able to see him. Okay, so uh, this is a, a cutaway view of the uh, Atlas uh, detector. Uh, all these things are designed a little bit like cylindrical onions with each onion layer optimized for uh, detecting uh, a different type of particle, uh, charged particles in the middle, uh, photons, uh, nuclear particles, muons on the outside. And uh, the Atlas, like CMS, put together by over 2,000 scientists and engineers, including more than 800 graduate students from nearly 40 countries, and uh, somebody calculated it has several times more components than a Saturn V moon rocket. So let's just hope it doesn't blow up. Here's the startup of the uh, LHC. And uh, true fame was uh, being featured on the Google search page for one day. Uh, it was much more important than the fact that a billion people watched it on TV. Uh, I thought that the CERN press office was crazy when they said they're going to have Eurovision come and photo, you know, and, and video the launch. Sorry, not the launch, the startup. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, a billion people tuned in. I don't think they were there to look for the Higgs boson. Yep, it works. At least it started off by working. And uh, this is uh, one of the uh, Atlas uh, collaborators. Uh, so. Uh, Born in Argentina, studied in Chile, worked a long time in Germany, now based in uh, Israel, and uh, helps Palestinians come to serve. <laughs> Salam alaikum. So he was very happy for a moment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then there was a problem. Uh, so the problem was uh, in the electrical connection between uh, two of the magnets. Uh, built up a resistance, measured in nano-ohms, but that was enough because of the very large currents to uh, melt the connection, which then melted the cryostat, melted the vacuum pipe, uh, the super superfluid uh, helium became a gas, pressure build up, pushing magnets apart, big mess. So uh, the repairs are underway, uh, and uh, in fact, the last magnet was put back into the uh, tunnel uh, a few days ago, and uh, the uh, plan is to uh, restart operations uh, later on this year. So what is the LHC going to do? Uh, we don't know. That's why we're building it. Uh, but one of the things it might do is uh, make a Higgs boson. So here's a simulation of a Higgs boson. Production, two protons collide along this axis here, uh, produce couple of hundred particles, and amongst those is this very unstable Higgs boson that decays into these two energetic particles over here, electron-positron pair, and a couple of muons over there. So that's uh, one of the things 
that uh, the ATLAS and CMS collaborations will start looking for, uh, we hope, in a few months' time. So the Higgs might decay into four leptons. That was what you saw on that slide. Or it might decay into two photons. Or it might decay into two tau leptons, and so on. Uh, there's many different ways in which the Higgs boson <coughs> might show up. There's probably literally dozens of uh, different searches now being prepared by the Atlas and CMS collaborators. So when will the LHC discover the Higgs boson? Well, first of all, we don't know if it will discover the Higgs boson. But if the Higgs boson looks like the standard model, then uh, as a function of the mass that you see along here, uh, the amount of collisions, the amount of luminosity you need depends on the mass. So there's a range here around 160, 170 GV, where with a relatively small amount of luminosity, you would be able to tell whether it exists or not. In fact, Fermilab has already told us that it's, it's not in this range here. Somewhat more luminosity, you could start to be able to claim a uh, five standard deviation signal and hence a, a gold-plated discovery. Uh, but you need the best part of 10 inverse femtobarns in order to uh, prove that the Higgs boson exists. Maybe a little bit less if you're happy just to prove it does not exist. So you know, finding the Higgs boson or not uh, would be a big deal. Uh, it's important to us to know how the symmetry of the standard model is broken. It's important as a matter of principle to know whether there are such things as elementary scalar fields. The Higgs, as I'll mention in a moment, might actually determine the fate of the standard model. It could tell us what happened in the universe when it was a picosecond old. Maybe the Higgs played a role in generating the matter in the universe. Maybe a related particle uh, caused cosmological inflation. And maybe the fact that the Higgs field has energy density, maybe this could give us some insight into dark energy. So let me say just a couple of words about two of these. Let me talk about the possible fate of the standard model. Because there's things that can go wrong with the standard model when you try to extrapolate it to high energies. One of the things that could go wrong is that the self-coupling of the Higgs, the potential of the Higgs, could blow up as you go to a large renormalization scale. Uh, and that's actually illustrated here. Uh, if the Higgs, for example, weighed 250 GeV, and if you then extrapolated the theory, then you would find that it would blow up somewhere around 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 GeV. There's another disaster that could happen. If the Higgs is small, then the potential actually collapses uh, because of a normalization by the top quark. For example, if the Higgs were to weigh 120 GeV, then probably it would collapse at around 10 to the 8 GeV. So by measuring the mass of the Higgs, we will actually get some clue as to when the standard model might break down. So this is something which uh, we're quantifying at the moment on the basis of the current information that we have indirect and direct about the possible mass of the Higgs boson. So this is actually uh, a plot of confidence levels for the standard model, uh, incorporating the information from the precision electroweak data, the LEP and Tevatron Higgs searches. And as you see, the most likely range is here low Higgs masses and hence low values of the scale lambda at which the standard model might break down. And in fact, the blow-up scenario is excluded now at the 99.2% confidence level. This is another way of looking at it. This is the probability distribution for the Higgs boson. Uh, this is where it blows up. This is where the theory survives up to the Planck mass. And this is where it is unstable. The most likely value of the Higgs mass is in the region where the standard model is unstable. That's good news. Cheer up. If the standard model is unstable, that means there has to be something else. 
And uh, this is the confidence level as a function of this instability scale under various different assumptions. Picture is always pretty much the same. The preferred scenario is that the vacuum of the standard model is unstable, but we cannot exclude the possibility that it might actually apply all the way up to the standard model, up to the Planck scale. On the other hand, you guys with the LHC, you will determine the fate of the universe, or at least the fate of the standard model, because by measuring the Higgs, uh, you will tell us whether we're in this unstable region or whether we're in the region where you can extrapolate up to infinite energy. Now, I, I just talked a little bit about uh, dark energy. Uh, dark energy is actually maybe the, the biggest puddle in astrophysics and cosmology because something like two-thirds of the energy density of the universe is in this so-called dark energy that fills empty space in between the particles of matter. So it's a big deal from the point of view of cosmology. The problem for particle physics is that actually it's a very, very small deal. Uh, from, if you put it, express the dark energy density in particle physics units, you get 10 to the minus 48 GeV to the fourth. Much smaller than the typical energy density in QCD. Much smaller than what you would, might have expected from the Higgs, or from supersymmetry, or from grand unified theories, or from a generic theory of quantum gravity. Now, sometimes cosmologists are off by a few orders of magnitude. Sometimes particle physicists are off by a few orders of magnitude. But to be off by 124 orders of magnitude looks a little bit careless. Uh, it's clear that we need new physics. Uh, I think it's fair to say that theorists do not have any good idea what this new physics is. So I think the only solution is experimental. You guys have to go out and measure the properties of the Higgs boson and tell us whether we're barking up the right tree or not. <coughs> so maybe there is more physics besides the standard model. And in particular, maybe there's supersymmetry. Now, uh, people, of course, have looked for supersymmetric particles, and uh, they haven't found them except maybe these guys doing G minus two measurements, uh, but maybe not. Uh, the guys who really might have found supersymmetry are the guys who measure the density of dark matter. And uh, they actually have a fairly accurate value for the cosmological density of dark matter, which, uh, if you believe it, puts quite a tight constraint on the properties of any theory beyond the standard model, such as supersymmetry. I put G minus two, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon back again, because I haven't completely given up hope on it, and I'll come back to that later on. Okay, so uh, in order to uh, interpret uh, the absence of supersymmetric signals, you need some sort of a model, and the conventional thing is to assume the minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model. Now, this is an extremely beautiful theory, except for the fact that supersymmetry has to be broken. And uh, when you break supersymmetry, this introduces uh, any number of extra parameters. And uh, despite the best efforts of our string theoretical friends, we still don't really have any uh, very good idea of what is the origin and what are the values of these parameters. So it's often assumed that these parameters are universal, but there's no particularly good reason why that should be the case. That's just primarily a matter of convenience. Uh, I might mention, by the way, that uh, this framework, which I call the constrained MSSM, is often called minimal supergravity, or MSUGRA. Uh, in fact, minimal supergravity often, well, it does impose additional relations. And in fact, if you really wanted to analyze M Sugra, you would actually do something different from what I'm doing in the uh, next few slides. So uh, here's a compilation of the current constraints on the uh, CMSSM. So on the horizontal axis, we have a supposedly universal uh, supersymmetric fermion mass. Here we have a supposedly universal supersymmetric scalar mass. Uh, lightest supersymmetric particle should not be charged. That rules out that region. 
Uh, you have to avoid messing up what we know about bottom quark decay. That means outside the green region. You want to get the right relic density. That means you should be in that blue strip. And you may or may not uh, believe that there is a supersymmetric contribution to the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. If you do, that puts you in that pink region. I should say, by the way, this is assuming that the lightest supersymmetric particle is a uh, neutral uh, partner of the photon Z and Higgs boson, which is not necessarily the case. But if it is the case, then this is the sort of signal that people will be looking for at the LHC. So uh, here you see towers corresponding to the deposition of energy in different parts of the detector. Uh, here is a transverse view through the detector. So what you see is a lot of energy coming over this side and nothing visible, at least nothing much visible, over the other side. So the interpretation of this type of event, if it were seen, would be that there has to be some invisible particle carrying away this missing energy, and it might be uh, the particle of dark matter. So the, the principle of this is a little bit like playing billiards. Right? So when you play billiards, one ball goes to the left, and there's another ball that goes to the right. Yep. But here, you see two balls going to the right and no balls going to the left. So that means there has to be something invisible going to the left, and that's the dark matter particle in this simulation. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> so how soon might supersymmetry be detected? So a few months ago, ago we did a, an analysis of the supersymmetric parameter space uh, in the simplest version of the theory, uh, including G minus 2. And this is the 68% confidence level region. This is the 95% confidence level region. This is the supersymmetric scalar mass. This is the supersymmetric fermion mass. Superposed, you see the uh, contours uh, for the amount of LHC luminosity at a given center of mass energy that you would need to discover supersymmetry. So even with the amount of data which they are promising for next year, you should be able to cover certainly that red dash line, hopefully also that green dotted line, and that will be enough to cover the 68% confidence level region. So I am 68% confident that you will discover supersymmetry next year. So that was what happens in the uh, simplest possible model. Uh, in fact, we also looked at a somewhat more complicated model. I won't go into the details of it, uh, but it's, it's very similar in the conclusions. So here is the spectrum here. Here is the lightest supersymmetric particle. That would be the dark matter particle. And over here on the right, you have the corresponding analysis in the more complicated model. Very similar. The conclusions seem to be relatively stable. Now, that previous plot showed you the most likely value. Uh, but what is the chi-squared likelihood function? Uh, here you see in the two different models, preferred value is around 100 GeV for the mass of the lightest supersymmetric particle. Uh, but uh, at the two sigma level, it could be twice as heavy. And if you want to go to three sigma, it could be quite a lot heavier. So like I said, I'm only 68% confident that you'll find supersymmetry next year. Uh, actually, what you will look for at the LHC is primarily the gluino. That is the thing that is produced directly at the LHC, and then it decays into other stuff, and eventually maybe into the neutralino. So here we are. Uh, the gluino may well weigh less than, let's say, 1,500 GeV, well within the reach of the LHC. Uh, squarks. So those are the supersymmetric partners of the quarks. Uh, it turns out that in both these theories, their masses are very tightly correlated with that of the gluino. So you know one, you know them all. So I, that's 
the prospects for ATLAS and CMS discovering supersymmetry. Uh, how about other experiments? Uh, well, one example is uh, looking for rare B decays, which is going to be uh, the main business of the LHCB experiment. So uh, we did an analysis, or we're doing an analysis also of that in these supersymmetric models. In the uh, CMSSM, it turns out to be very similar to what you have in the standard model. So difficult to find strong evidence for supersymmetry there. However, if you go to a more complicated model, BS goes to mu mu could show up at a much higher rate. So this is another potentially a smoking gun, possibly visible next year for the LHCB detector. As you can see, this is a work in progress. Uh, we sort of have to tidy up that simulation over there. So that almost brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. Uh, I've told you that there's decent prospects, 68% likelihood of uh, finding supersymmetry at the LHC uh, maybe next year. Uh, there are, of course, other ways of looking for supersymmetry, and I want to put the LHC guys uh, on their toes so that they don't relax. Uh, people, of course, are looking for directly for supersymmetric dark matter. Uh, they're looking for annihilation in the galactic halo. They're looking for annihilation in the galactic center. They're looking for annihilation of dark matter particles in the core of the sun and earth. <coughs> and they're looking directly for scattering of dark matter particles on nuclei in the laboratory. <coughs> so we've also had a look at that. So this is uh, upper limits on the scattering rate of uh, dark matter particles given by current direct dark matter search experiments, solid lines. The dashed lines are the prospects for experiments that are now underway. And this ellipse here is what we uh, predict in our analysis of the uh, simplest supersymmetric model. As an experimentalist commented to me the other day, the theoretical predictions are always just below the experimental limit. They are just below the present experimental limit, but above the experimental sensitivity. So uh, the dark matter guys are on their way. Uh, that's also true in this somewhat more complicated model. So uh, I think the LHC hair had better stop sleeping against the rock and get up and start running. So that brings me to the uh, end of my talk. I hope that indeed I've convinced you that uh, the LHC is uh, not only the world's most powerful microscope, but uh, also a telescope able to look for dark matter that the cosmologists can't see, able to go back to a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, uh, which the telescopes can't do. And uh, it will be even more exciting if we don't find the Higgs boson. Thank you. Thank you.